When ChatGPT burst into the public consciousness late last year, its abilities stunned the world. Headlines blared that it was able to pass the bar exam and hold human-like text conversations. It writes computer code, term papers, and even Shakespearean iambic pentameter. It is not just that one program. Google, Microsoft, and many other companies have their own artificial intelligence software. People have been fascinated and frightened. The fright was heightened last month when more than 350 computer scientists and tech executives signed onto a one-sentence statement that said, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. One of the signatories is a man who has been called the godfather of artificial intelligence, Jeffrey Hinton. Hinton left his job at Google so that he could freely discuss the risks of AI. And that is what I want to ask him about today. Jeffrey, welcome. Thank you. So first, before we get into the bad stuff, I, I want to you know, give people a sense of the, the amazing creativity that produced uh, AI and the, and the thrill you must have felt. So at what point did you start to realize as a, as a professor that you were beginning to, you know, you were getting computers to be able to, to think? So back in 1986, we started using an algorithm that was invented by many different people called backpropagation. And at that point, we could get computers to do a little bit of thinking, um, but it didn't work as well as we hoped. And at that point, we didn't really understand that all we needed was more data and bigger computers. But by about 2006, we had that. And then we started seeing real progress. We started seeing artificial neural networks modeled after the brain, being able to do all sorts of things that conventional symbolic AI had not been able to do, like recognize objects and images, recognize speech, and be able to predict the next word in a sentence. For you, was there a kind of crossing of the Rubicon moment when you realized that uh, computers were just getting so good and so powerful at AI? So I think in 2012, two of my graduate students, Ilya Sutskova, who's now the chief scientist at OpenAI, and Alex Krzyzewski, um, made neural nets that were much better than previous systems at recognizing objects and images. So you'd have a million images with a thousand different kinds of object. And previously, people couldn't do better than getting 25% wrong. And suddenly, Ilya and Alex got 15% wrong. And that was a huge breakthrough. It's clear that this stuff was now working much better than previous methods, previous ways of doing AI. When did you start to go from being exhilarated about all this to worrying? Really only a few months ago. So I, I mean, I was always worried about things like um, what would happen to the people whose jobs were lost to AI, and would there be battle robots, and what about all the fake news it was going to produce, and what about the echo chambers being produced by getting people to click on things that make them indignant. Right. Um, those, all those worries I was worried about. But the idea that this stuff will get smarter than us and might actually replace us, I only got worried about a few months ago, when I suddenly flipped my view my view had been that I'm working on trying to make digital intelligence by trying to make it like the brain. And I assumed the brain is better. And we're just trying to sort of catch up with the brain. Um, I suddenly realized maybe the algorithm we've got is actually better than the brain already. And when we scale it up, we'll get things smarter than us. And, and the fundamental reason for that, I, I think you, you, you've said, is that computers learn instantaneously and Every computer in the world, if it's connected, learns, learns, you know, gets to know everything, right? So explain, explain that scale of computing power compared to the brain. Okay, so if you learn something, and now you want to convey that to me, what you do is you produce sentences, and I try and figure out how I should change the connection strengths in my brain so that I would produce the same sentences. But there's not that much information in a sentence. So it's a very slow and painful right, business. Right conveying what you know to somebody else. But if you have two different digital computers that have exactly the same model of the world, and one of them sees one document, and another one sees a different document, and they each learn from the document they're seeing, and so if you have 10,000 computers like that, 
it's like you had 10,000 people all learning from different data. And as soon as one person learns something, everybody knows it. And everybody has, 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 has intelligence is strengthened by that averaging, by the, right? Yes. So, so you, you, it, something actually means theoretically even, human beings could never get to that place. We could never see enough data. It would take us, I don't know how long, yeah. but thousands and thousands of years to see as much data as GPT-4 has seen. We, we just couldn't do it in a lifetime. And so that's at one level, again, exhilarating to think of the, the, the extraordinary power that this computer will have, but worrying. It is worrying because we don't know any examples of more intelligent things being controlled by less intelligent things. I mean, with human societies, you often have dictators who aren't as intelligent as some of the peasants, but that's not a big difference. They're in the same league. But here, these things will get much more intelligent than us. And the worry is, can we keep them working for us when they're much more intelligent than us? They will have, for example, learned how to deceive. They'll be able to deceive us if they want to.